And today we're gonna to be talking about some of the reasons behind the 91% increase in involuntary commitments in North Carolina, what that means for mental health patients and some state legislation that aims to provide some non-police community-based alternatives to mental health crises. So I'm Taylor Knopf. I'm a mental health reporter with North Carolina Health News. You may have seen some of my stories about the involuntary commitment trends in our state. I'll be your moderator. And let me introduce our guests. So Bob Ward, if you could raise your hand, is an assistant public defender in Mecklenburg County. He has represented mental health patients through involuntary commitment court proceedings for nearly a decade. Before that, he worked in drug and mental health treatment courts for 20 years. And after noticing a rise in his own caseload, Bob spearheaded an effort with Peer Voice North Carolina to track down statewide IVC data, which is not publicly reported. We'll talk about that. Um, next, we've got Lori Coker. She is a former psychiatric nurse. She has family members with mental health challenges, and she has experienced her own challenges with a life impacting mood disorder. These combination of these experiences have led her to advocate for people with mental illness in North Carolina and to establish Green Tree, which is a peer support center in Winston-Salem. She is also actively engaged with the Peer Voice North Carolina. So our guests have kindly shared resources that we will make available after today's conversation. And we will have some time at the end of today for questions. So please find your chat box and you can drop those there. So we're just gonna get right to it. Um, I'm going to start off with our legal expert, Bob, if you could briefly tell us what an involuntary commitment is and when it is supposed to be used. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Taylor, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate the time and opportunity to speak about this. Um, basically, a, an involuntary commitment is a, a court order that authorizes a hospital to, as I tell my clients, to lock the doors and force medication if they, if they need to. It usually means that someone um, allegedly has a, a mental health illness that has reached an acute stage. It's not just enough to have a mental illness. You basically have to have some behavior that shows that you lack insight and judgment in your behavior. You might become a harm to yourself or others. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. Just so we're all on the same um, grounds as to what we're talking about here. So um, involuntary commitments have been rising in North Carolina over the last decade. Like I mentioned before, we've seen a 91% increase um, in the state over the last decade, which out, uh, far outpaces the population growth for our state. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how IVCs are overused and why. So one contributing factor is the breakdown in community mental health services. So Lori, I'm going to throw this to you. Could you tell us a little bit more about that breakdown and how it impacts patients? Yeah, I think it's really important when we think about system issues to realize that our system arises from our statewide community culture. And like a lot of states, we have misunderstood what mental ill being really is all about for some time. So what we're seeing right now is uh, things are coming home to roost. It's not like the system was really working well at, until the la that decade that we've started measuring. But um, so we have a, uh, our thinking has been that a mental health challenge is a, a brain disorder and that it needs to be fixed with medications. But what other countries and some other states in our country have come to realize is that these are really biopsychosocial spiritual issues. And so we need a different approach and um, a different understanding of how we engage people who are in distress. Having said that, um, one of the other issues is in our state, uh, a lot of folks who have learned so much from their personal experiences and from a lot of personal research, and some of you out there know what I'm talking about, that personal research we've done, we have so much we could have been offering through the years to help shape our system or, or direct it in a new direction. But we have found that we are, are really by and large excluded from any of the discussions where the plans are being made for you know, how, how to implement mental health services. And so we don't have a very well-informed system and therefore all the little things that look like uh, on paper from one city <laughs> um, that are supposed to be helping myself, my peers, um, they're not working and we have no way of giving feedback to help them get better. So this is a major issue and therefore we have such challenges accessing services and how people experience services has become out of the rush of uh, trying to everything work within a Medicaid managed care system. 
um, it's gotten to where a lot of folks no longer go. They just have dropped out of the system because services are, are not fun to experience. And so um, I think we have to realize that our system has a lot of flaws because we're not rethinking all together as a community what it really needs to be like. And therefore, how do you make things welcoming and accessible to people earlier on before they go into crisis? Thanks for that. Um, it, Bob, let's go to you for a minute. Um, what are some ways you've seen the IVC process overused or used inappropriately? Uh, well, I would say uh, more excessively uh, and, and maybe inappropriate in the sense that if there were an alternative, it would be inappropriate, but because there is no other alternative, then it's the only available thing. But basically, uh, one of the things that sort of surprised me coming back to handle uh, the civil commitment caseload was to find out that a lot of people come to hospitals voluntarily. They want treatment. They're trying to get help, uh, but they have to get transported from the ER to a mental health hospital somewhere in the state. And so um, they have to do a transport order. So they have to do a commitment order in order to get somebody, uh, you know, to get the help that they need. Uh, and my clients, when they find, when they see me in the court, in the in the hospital, uh, my 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 uh, frequent uh, introduction is, "Hi, my name is Bob Ward. I'm from the public defender's office, but you're not in any trouble." And and they're surprised to know that there's even a court action against them. And um, so that's one area is in the transportation need for transportation. Uh, I. I I do think another area is in the commitment process itself. I've heard from doctors. There's a doctor that I know who came from another state. Uh, he was surprised to know how many commitments there were here. Uh, and he said there aren't as many in his state. He said they have a lot of peer support at the front end to get people to voluntarily engage and stay in treatment. To, to Lori's point, um, I'm, I've been really surprised since coming and doing this work that uh, there has not been this involvement, uh, more of a, of a conversation and, and uh, work with the recovering community. Um, I know with treatment courts, that's what we did. We actually went to the recovering community and said, how do we do this? What do we do? And we put together a pro protocol and plans for that. And we saw some amazing success and still see that success. Come to involuntary commitment side, I, I just don't see that. Right. Um, just a reminder that you can drop questions for Bob and Lori into our chat box. So that's there. Uh, so we know from studies and personal stories that IVC process sows distrust in the mental health system. Like Bob just said, people didn't know there was even a court order against them. And often these involuntary commitments trigger a law enforcement transport. Um, so the officer is there to transport somebody. Um, so this can deter people from getting help in the future or disclosing their thoughts of suicide or feelings of depression in the future. So Lori, can you tell us a little bit more about how a patient experiences an involuntary commitment and why that distrust is there? Well, I think this is an important discussion we're having because how somebody is met in crisis, whether you have a, a label or not, how we are met in crisis by the community around us sets so much of the stage for what happens next or further on down the road. And so um, in all these numbers of, of individuals who have had to be involuntarily committed, we have folks who are um, um, stepping into a situation where they are, are kind of dehumanized because they're stripped of their self-determination. And um, that's a hope killer. And so while we wanna be supporting people toward recovering mental health, we're putting them on a path where we kind of take an authoritarian approach that all of us know more about you and how, how to fix you than you do. And um, it, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that in, in humanity that doesn't work. And so, um, yeah, I've heard many, many stories and I know what it's like to see my own son at the age of 15 um, be put in handcuffs and, and ankle shackles and uh, led to a police car and then going from the police car to a hospital. And um, it's like, it just, uh, it derails your life. Even if, even if just a few hours later, the ED doc decides you don't need to be there or somebody, you know, um, it's that, that's the thing that, that suddenly so, so far others you from the rest of the society, the rest of your world. And so um, it, it, it can have tragic consequences. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the alternatives that are out there. Um, what ways can we support people so they avoid needing to be hospitalized through an IVC? 
Um, Lori, do you want to start by telling us a little bit more about peer support and what that is? Sure. Well, um, I know uh, we opened a, a peer support center in Winston-Salem uh, about eight and a half years ago. And the things that we learn from each other help us to learn to, to respond uh, in more effective ways with each other. That's just, that's what community life should be about. And what we've learned is that folks have not felt safe or comfortable talking about a lot of their experiences within their clinical settings because they fear the, the early judgment and getting jettisoned into that uh, forced clinical situation. And so we've tried to ensure that uh, peer support is a safe place where we can just kind of hold space with somebody while they unpack some of what they're going through. And then it's amazing how just by being, by listening well and helping somebody kind of think through, they can reframe their experiences and the level of distress goes down. They learn a little more resilience. They learn a little more about themselves. They are strengthened for the next time that this distress comes up again. And um, one of the things that's been happening at Green Tree is that we realized a lot of folks, and I'm told by the uh, interim chief of psychiatry and behavioral health at Baptist Hospital that more than half the folks that come into the ED there, and these are voluntary, but more than half of them are not deemed to need inpatient care. Um, and they don't, they haven't known what to do with folks. They just kind of, they get released back out to the, streets or to go home to what may be triggering a lot of what's going on. So Green Tree has opened up a little spot we call the refuge where for a brief period of around 24 hours, we can support somebody in a really comfortable, welcoming little house and um, just help them um, get a hot meal, have a shower if they want, get some sleep, listen to some nice music and just feel supported by somebody else who's also been through that level of distress in their lives. And by the end of that period, um, we are able to kind of figure out how we can kind of come alongside and help get them connected to the next thing that they may desire. And um, in, in doing this, we're seeing it have just the results we thought it, it would have. Um, the, um, we've also had law enforcement officers, or actually I'm gonna to try to start calling them public safety officers and trying to reframe my thinking. <laughs> But we've had somebody from the sheriff's department and somebody from the police department, these are chiefs over at the opioid task force in our county, have come to Green Tree and they are really eager to see how um, the refuge might be a fit for some of the folks that they encounter. And uh, because they believe that some of them, the distress, they see people in the context. When you walk through the hospital doors, you, you pretty much leave the context outside, right? So they see people in the context and they know what's triggering what's going on. And they have felt there's so many times that if they could just be in a neutral space and just have some time to exhale, they can kind of, you know, re-regulate and, and, and take the steps towards solutions. And um, whereas they, they fear that sometimes the hospital setting is, it actually is uh, antithetical to, to solutions and some people, for some people. So um, we may be moving to that as an alternative. And I think what will happen is through time, we'll realize that um, authoritarian-based, police-based, whatever you want to call it, crisis response is indeed, it's antiquated, it's out of date. And so this is one little way with our limited resources to kind of test it out and collect the data and, and see what we can learn um, and, and help help our statewide community take a look at other alternatives as well. Thanks for that, Lori, appreciate it. Um, jumping over to the legal side of things, um, Bob, you have helped establish the first pilot project for psychiatric advance directives and psychiatric health care powers of attorney under crisis navigation project. Can you tell us a little bit about how a psychiatric advance directive um, could help a client of yours? Uh, sure, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't give a thanks and shout out to uh, uh, Shereen Carrico and B.B. Smith, who uh, helped us with gathering numbers, but also uh, tremendously so. Um, I mean, I, I helped, I did my part, I guess, with regards to the uh, psychiatric advance directors, but the real workhorses in this, I think, have been there, uh, those, those individuals and their organizations. And um, but the psychiatric advance directive is, a, uh, is, is actually a self-directed legal instrument that basically it's 
I, I call it, if you're familiar with IEP plans for schools, if you've got a, a child with special needs, here, here's your IEP plan. This is kind of like an IEP plan for the hospital. Basically says, look, you know, if, if one of Lori's individuals that she's helping is having a crisis and it looks like they really might need to go to the hospital, um, they go there and this, this, it gives them information about them, what, what medications work, what I like, what I don't like, what, that type of thing. So it, it, it's very, it gives them voice. It helps them um, em empower the uh, healthcare workers. And it, it, and it also authorizes them if the doctor determines that they lack capacity, not that they're a danger to themselves or others, but that they seem to be in that lacking judgment, lacking insight range, uh, they can take that instrument and use it to hold someone. So it's basically you authorizing the hospital to hold you, you know, based on your plan. And, um, uh, you know, and Dr. Marvin Schwartz, who actually was, was the, the um, founder, I think, of, of uh, this project and, and uh, the, the National Center for uh, Psychiatric Advanced Directors is right here in North Carolina. As he describes it, it it's kind of this Ulysses plan where, you, you know, you, you basically tell your support system to put your plan in place when things are kind of off. And uh, the, the big problem with this, though, is, is that um, the hospitals, uh, the, the legal profession really hasn't sort of taken this on as a, a project to try to try to create this pathway. And um, it, the, they're still valid, even if you get it involuntarily committed, that it would help me to know, here's my client's, you know, advanced directive, this works, this doesn't, because the, you know, two of the breakdowns that you have is uh, within our system is communication uh, and, uh, and understanding. And uh, the, a lot of people stay at the hospitals because they will refuse to give permission to talk to family members. Uh, along with this healthcare power or this with the um, uh, psychiatric advanced directive is a healthcare power of attorney that's focused on uh, the psychiatric. Many folks don't know if you just do a general healthcare power of attorney and your loved one goes into the psych ward, you come in and say, I'd like to talk with a doctor and, and have, have access. They will say if that, that patient doesn't sign anything, they can't honor it because unless it specifically is in accordance with the statute that deals with uh, the psychiatric permission, it doesn't apply. And I've had situations like that where families have been very frustrated and kept out of the loop. But I think also along those lines, and this is what I think, just writing or drafting a document is not going to get you there. And to, to Lori's point about, about having these alternatives, I think this needs to be even broader than, than merely the individual who happens to be you know, bearing the burden or the, you know, the opportunity, uh, because there are, there are some hidden blessings in some of these illnesses. People have some special talents and they're given some special, I, I think that's what's missed in a lot of this is that I think it's all bad news and it's, it's not. These are very creative people, uh, very powerful, very, very uh, productive people. Uh, and and um, uh, I think that gets missed in the discussion, but the families are getting almost nothing in the way of support. Uh, and so when our state sort of went, when it, uh, when it went away from having more case management and more social workers in the system and said, we're not gonna have them, we're basically gonna let the families become the social workers and the case managers, but they didn't train them. They didn't do anything to do it. And I do think the psychiatric advanced directive could be uh, a vehicle for which that you could begin to, to uh, provide training, not just for the individual with them, but, but for family members as well. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that um, explanation. These are complicated topics, so your expertise is very valuable. Um, uh, I just want to mention, too, um, all of this, bringing all of this topic to light over the past um, year or so has prompted lawmakers to introduce some legislation. Um, you may have seen um, there are two bills, possibly three, still alive in the House um, at the North Carolina General Assembly that would create non-police crisis intervention teams and more peer support centers like the one that Lori runs. Um, specifically, it would be modeled after one in Charlotte. Um, they would get the money if this bill passed to create four more peer support centers like the one in Charlotte. Um, advocates like Bob and Lori and so many others at the Peer Voice North Carolina dug up IVC data that wasn't being publicly reported, like we'd said before. Um, we at North Carolina Health News reported that trend and analyzed some of the problems that that data br brought up and lawmakers took note and this work group formed and along with today's guests who helped form that legislation, um, these bills came about. So um, I'll just tell you real quickly about them. House Bill 786 would allow a $2 million pilot project grant fund for police and sheriffs to establish eight non-police crisis response units 
and seven co-response units, meaning mental health specialists would go out with law enforcement to respond to mental health crises. So that's um, one bill that is still alive. And then um, the House Bill 788 would provide uh, $600,000 to that Promise um, Resource Network in Charlotte to create four more peer-run wellness centers in the state, two in an urban set in, setting and two in a rural communities. Mm -hmm. So those um, are still alive. Um, we spoke to some of the lawmakers who are part of that. Um, Representative John Autry was the one who introduced those and he's out of Mecklenburg. And then um, it has strong bipartisan support um, including Representative Donnie Lambeth, who's the co-chair of the House Health Committee. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke to him yesterday and he said um, that he's an advocate for all three of these bills. And he told our editor that they're all really good bills and he hoped that the two with funding could be worked into the budget process um, this uh, session. So that's still ongoing. So just want to give you an update as to where those bills were. Um, the two with funding may still have a chance to be worked into that budget um, cycle. So thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your interest and support. Um, we're committed to making programs like this and all of our content in NC Health News free, um, but it's not free to produce. So please consider making a donation. We'll put that donation link in the chat. So let's go ahead and open it up to questions. We have a couple minutes left. So Shelby, our um, engagement manager is gonna read some of your questions out. Hi y'all. Um, Taylor, I think the quickest question, Glenn Simpson asked, what were those bill numbers? Uh, yes, I will read I... the bills one more time. So <laughs> um, House Bill 786 is the $2 million pilot project for the crisis response units. And House Bill 788 is for the peer run wellness centers. And then there was a bill to track IVC data because we do lack this data that we've been talking about. And so that was House Bill 787. Um, we're still unclear because it does not have funding whether or not it still has a, a life in the General Assembly right now. Cool. Okay. And then we got several questions about a couple topics. So I'm going to kind of combine those into one. Um, one of them was, is Medicare, Medicaid transformation going to change anything here? Um, and that was asked by Tim Buick. And um, someone else as well. But yes, is Medicaid transformation going to change anything that's happening in IBCs? This is Laurie. I think that's a good question. Uh, my concern, and I know other advocates have been very concerned that uh, while we've watched the unrolling of Medicaid reform, um, the only real placeholder for mental health is, you know, th about the contracts of who's going to be managing the care. We're not really hearing much other discussion. There's not much uh, actual live meaningful communication between the community that has to depend on all this and the leadership in Raleigh. And so we're, we don't feel like mental health has been really a whole lot on the radar screen. And um, so I would anticipate there may be some distant changes as communities, first of all, get their new systems in place and straighten out who's doing what with whom. <laughs> and then secondly, uh, figure out, okay, all right, there, here's where the problems are, what can we do about it? My hope would be that we're right now having these discussions about what we can do about it and not let it wait and to see what happens with Medicaid reform, because that's that's a North Carolina thing. We do things in a very linear way. And that's part of why a lot of what we do is out of date. So we, we're, we're not catching and thinking in a transformational way about how to work on this while we're also working on this. So that's opinion based also in some fact. <laughs> That was also asked by Patrick McQueenie. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. And then we also got a few questions about kind of isn't this the only, only option? Um, Bonnie Shell says, if community help is missing and you can't get fairly quick appointment with a therapist or doctor, isn't the only way to get help to say you're feeling suicidal and be put in the hospital for liability, not necessarily care. Wow. Uh, I, I probably would let like Lori answer, but I'll just go ahead and take a shot at that one. Uh, yes, that is definitely the case. Uh, frequently, people will tell you uh, it is so hard to get services. The best way to get linked to services is to have a crisis and to be engaged. And unfortunately, the cycle continues. And this is where this revolving door hit, hits. 
And I, I forgot to mention, we've kind of left a big elephant out of this picture, and this is related to that, that data um, legislation. Um, there, there's another side to commitments that I didn't mention. You get a hearing within about 10 days. That's what it says under the law. But um, because uh, we don't have enough resources in our community uh, to get people there, uh, people were sort of having to wait in hospitals, in ERs, in the hospitals that are not psychiatric hospitals. And this is called hospital boarding. And it, it's, I've had clients wait as long as four months before they get to see a judge, a treating psychiatrist or whatever. They literally are in the hospital for four months and they don't get these services. The folks that tend to be stuck in these situations are those that are in, when you've got certainly a backlog in, in, in uh, you know, where, where there's not enough room at the psych hospitals here or elsewhere in the state, but also where people with high integrated needs, what basically means you've got multiple diagnoses and with Medicaid transformation and so forth, I think it's the kind of thing that that may be kind of a shuffling the deck on the on the on the, on the Titanic. I, I think the biggest problem is we just don't have, as Lori said, this sort of uh, a more modern approach, more um, uh, more accessible services for folks, whether you've got simple conditions or more complex conditions. I don't know if I, I caught the if I answered your question, but that's um, you know, that, that I, I want to make sure that I got in. And Bob, I think it's important that we share too, we were discussing this the other day, that there's a difference between getting a magistrate's order to commit somebody or, or to take somebody for, for an evaluation in the ED. That, that's a little different from actually an involuntary commitment order. Um, but we need to look at both of these together because the damage is done once you know someone's taken out some kind of order that lets somebody else take total authority over you and get you somebody somewhere else. So it's actually broader than just IVCs. Um, it, it's about forced treatment and, and how helpful is that really? And the force starts before there's actually a judge who orders inpatient stay. And like Bob says, people are waiting for a long, long time sometimes before a judge makes his determination. But um, as to Bonnie's uh, suggestion, I, I see quite a bit of that myself. Um, well, actually, we see a lot less of it through time at the Peer Center, but people have talked about uh, why they go to the ED. And, um, and this is a little different from the forced piece, but I think it's something we all need to understand as a statewide community. Sometimes when people are really struggling with feeling empty and unmotivated and isolated, some people go to the ED because it's stimulating to suddenly have you know, this pinnacle experience, whether it's healthy or has a good outcome or not. And um, I think if we have a system that's more attractive and welcoming earlier on, more relationally based, more peer support involved, um, we could see a reduction in that as well. But Bonnie was spot on with that comment. So we have several more questions and we are hitting nine. Um, I believe we discussed y'all have a couple more minutes to answer questions, but anybody is free to head out and nobody will be judging you for that. Um, I also wanna just jump in and say we are recording this and we will be sending it out and we will also um, send out some resources that Bob and Lori have shared. Yes, yeah, I will be putting together a whole page of resources, including their contact information and um, some of the, I've, I've been copying some of these things in the chat, the Peer Justice Initiative and things like that. So we will send out a lot of resources uh, this afternoon, probably. Um, uh, yes, okay, so next question. Lisa Gessler asks, has the use of psychiatric self-directives had any impact? I, I think it has uh, for the individual families. I, I don't know enough. We've not, uh, in the experience that I've had working particularly with Promise Resource Network, when I've, I've gone and given uh, a presentation or part of a presentation with the folks there, the people that we meet with are, are they feel empowered. They are grateful for this. It, it is something that they can use. Um, you know, I, I just happened to run into somebody, um, I won't say which hospital it was, but this week and um, happened to bring up the topic of it. And uh, it was an ER person and uh, she was very, um, you know, sort of adamant that these won't work, can't work. And I, so I, the, the problem that I have in this is not that people don't want them. People really want them. I mean, I will tell you, when I talk to clients in the court, you know, they're very upset about the fact that they've been committed. They want to avoid this. How do I avoid this again? And I tell them, I can't do much about it right now. I can maybe get this judgment off of you. We can kind of wait here and not get a judgment, which to Lori's point, a full civil 
commitment is when the judge signs the order, not when the magistrate does. It's part of a commitment process with the magistrate, but from a legal standpoint, until you get a judgment, you've not been fully civilly committed. But when they they hear this, yes, they want to do it, but there's nothing. I can't hand them off to somebody and say, okay, go talk to this person afterwards. And that was the one thing we learned in treatment courts is if you don't act right away within a particular crisis zone to engage someone relationally, where they can go and feel connected and they can feel empowered and they can get the tools that they need, the soft tools to deal with some of this stuff, you lose them. And this idea that you can just medicate people and give them appointment three weeks away or whatever and, and, and have it work out, it, it, I don't know under what paradigm of management they think that works. It just doesn't. And we have it. That's why it's so hard to get these numbers, uh, because um, uh, it, it seems that folks don't seem to want to know that. I, I really tend to think that the system doesn't want to know what it's doing to itself because you would have to change. And I, I, it, the time to change is now. We really do need to change. Could I add on the IVC issues, what we found locally is that most of those people, most individuals who have done them here have had the IVCs pretty much dismissed because the way our laws are written, for one thing, it's not an advanced directive, it's advanced instruction. And there's a little bit, you know, instruction and directive are, are kind of two different things. But um, the way it's written in our state is it's pretty easy for a doctor to make a you may call it clinical, but it's also somewhat subjective. <laughs> um, they can make the decision to overturn the, the advanced instruction. So what's gonna have to happen is, if we see enough of these get used that we finally have the culture shift within our hospitals to where they get it and feel better about regarding them, then I think they can be a real good thing. But I think in our state, it's gonna be a, take a, time, a while to get to that point. And I wanted to add right quick on House Bill 787, no, 788, one piece that's in that bill is about looking at um, our mental health systems um, culture of administration care practices and trying to shift it more toward a recovery rehabilitative approach versus the more strictly medical and crisis mode model. And um, that's a real important piece of this bill. And I just want people to read the bill carefully if you can go to it. Um, it's a real opportunity to make a shift that other states have already made. They have lead people trying to help take us off one road and get us on a more current road. So that's what we wanna see happen here. Yeah, big, big shout out for Lori for getting that in there because I will tell you, if there's one thing that I would look forward to in this whole session, if, if we can get just that set up, I think it can help, help move things. So yes, thank you for bringing that up again. I think I have two more questions I'm gonna to try to get in here. Um, one of them that was also asked a few different ways, Shelby Berry and Haley Cushman both spoke to, um, can you speak on the extended boarding times in emergency departments as a result of IVCs? Patients are remaining in the, in the emergency department for days, weeks, sometimes months throughout the state without any psych treatment because an inpatient bed is not available. Um, Haley works in a school system and was asking, how can we gain access to more resources to prevent hospitalization and or stays in the ER? Laura, you want to take that? Or? Well, the school, the young, the young people, we cannot, yeah, we, we, if we did not address what's happening with our youth right now, we would really miss an opportunity here. But um, I know I had an e email from the, the, not the behavioral health lead, but the chief of the ED copied to the chief of the pediatric ED at Baptist Hospital recently, talking about the need to do what we're doing with the refuge, but for families and youths. And so that's a model that I think all of us can be thinking about that we, we actually could have kind of refuge spaces where um, the youth and the families can go and the families can have a, a brief kind of support they need and then they can go home and and rest and regroup. And then that individual could have an opportunity to be in a neutral space with peer to peer support. Um, I know with, I had uh, situations in my family where um, I was fortunate that there was, there was one lady that just let my son, one of my sons have access to a room in her house, gave him the house key because we knew he deserved and needed neutral space away from us. And um, that, because I knew that crisis could be averted if he just had his own space sometimes, you know? And um, 
And that's part of what stayed in my mind about establishing the refuge. So I think there are gonna be opportunities, but we need to be able to be nimble and think outside the box and um, probably really challenge our state to use funding differently so that everything does not hinge on Medicaid eligibility. Um, that, that's probably a driver of a lot of our problems. Absolutely, and I just throw in Council for Children's Rights as a resource, particularly on the ch children's issue, and I'll, I'll let you go to the next question. Well, that actually leads into the last question. Um, Andrew Walsh asks, I assume a large percentage of IVC respondents are uninsured. Um, is there any data on that? Well, that's what we would like to find out. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there are some people, I think people that aren't here right now, maybe, uh, or Shereen might be able to speak to that. Um, but, you know, I, I, um, I find in my own practice that there's just this mix and it's many ways you're, you're better off if you, if it, if you have Medicaid, you know, Medicare, whatever, if you've got some government services, you've got access to services. If, uh, if you don't, you know, you may have some short-term supply, but I get people getting bills of ten thousand to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for for services and so forth. And uh, you know, it's 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 just wrong. I mean, it's just wrong with what we're doing to ourselves. Thanks so much, guys. Um, thank you all of our guests for coming. Again, we will send out this recording and links um, with helpful resources. Um, thank you for joining our first healthcare half hour. Hopefully you'll see us next time. Um, we'll come back hopefully monthly with a different, um, topic of conversation. So thank you thank all you. Thank for joining all. us today. Have a great day. Take care. You too. Trying to read some of the chat questions right quick. <laughs> Yeah, I was coming um, through so fast. There's no way I was going to be able to read that. I downloaded the chat, so um, I can send that to you. Oh, that'd be great. Yes, very interesting. And thank you, guests. You guys were wonderful today. Yeah.